Big layoffs at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, testing spacesuits for the moon, another flyby of Io, and our final look at Ingenuity. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. We've got some bad news to start this episode with, and that is we got the news that there were some massive layoffs at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Looks like there were 530 people laid off as well as dozens of contractors. And this is on top of the dozens of contractors that were laid off uh, a couple of weeks ago. And the cause of this is that NASA is waiting for a large amount of budget for it to be able to continue a bunch of the missions that it has in the works, the Mars sample return mission and others. And the problem is that that budget hasn't been approved by Congress. It's sort of stuck. And so because of this big wait and delay out of Congress, it's causing problems downstream at NASA. Now, I've gone into a much deeper interview with this with Casey Dreyer from the Planetary Society. We talk about the underlying causes as well as what implications it's going to have for Artemis, as well as the Mars sample return and other things. So definitely check that out. We don't know what impact this is going to have on NASA. Is this going to be a trimming of jobs across many different projects? Is this going to be some actual cancellations of different missions? So we'll keep you posted as we learn more. NASA is testing its lunar spacesuits. Over at Artemis, NASA's plans to send humans back to the moon, things are proceeding according to plan. Well, okay, so there's a slight delay. But NASA is going to need brand new spacesuits when they have their astronauts walk on the surface of the moon. You can't just go back to a museum, find the old Apollo spacesuits, crack them out, use them for the surface of the moon. They're too old. So NASA needs new spacesuits. They've partnered with a company called Axiom Space. And this is the same company that is actually building a private space station. They are sending private astronauts to space to the International Space Station, and they are building a new type of spacesuit. And NASA can't just use the spacesuits that they use for their extravehicular activities. Think about when they're floating in orbit doing maintenance on the International Space Station, they need something that can handle the wear and tear of being on the moon, different gravity environment, it's totally different requirements. So we learned that NASA has taken delivery of prototype spacesuits. And now the plan is to test these out at the NASA facility. So they've got a couple of things they're going to do. One is they're going to test the spacesuits in their zero gravity pool. This is a way that they test doing spacewalks at the International Space Station, this mock up of the space station, where the astronauts can work with various tools in zero gravity buoyancy, then they can take those lessons and apply them to when they're actually at the International Space Station to mimic the moon's gravity, they're going to have weights on them. So they will be down at the bottom of the pool, they will be experiencing some weight, but not the full weight of being on the surface of the Earth. The other thing that they've got is a lunar simulated facility. It's like a big sandbox, but of the moon. And so they have rocks that they can pick up. They have simulated regolith. And so the astronauts are going to test out how does the functionality of the spacesuit work? Can you kneel down, pick up rocks? How do the gloves work as you're grabbing rocks and using various tools? And so once they've had a chance to do all these tests, they'll be able to give their feedback to Axiom, and they can incorporate that into new versions of the spacesuits. James Webb discovers a galaxy that shouldn't exist. Now we've seen this before where astronomers were looking through space and they discovered something completely unexpected. This time they found a galaxy that really shouldn't be there. It's located just less than 100 million light years away. And it contains gas and dust and dark matter, but it doesn't seem to contain almost any stars. And that's very unusual for a galaxy. It's a dwarf galaxy. So unlike a big spiral galaxy like the Milky Way, which has like 400 billion stars in it, it has about 100 million stars in it. And it's thought that because it's so far away from other galaxies, it didn't have any of the interactions that led to causing star formation in it. And so it's kind of like primordial leftover from the Big Bang. And it's really giving astronomers a sense of how it's not just the galaxies itself that you have to understand, you have to understand it in the context of the larger community that the galaxy is in. These galaxies release gas and dust and radiation and supernova going off and those are causing star formation, even if they're separated by many millions of light years away. The Berlin asteroid was found. On January 21st, 2024, 
astronomers noticed an asteroid on collision course with Earth. They released a notification to other astronomers who joined in, made more observations, were able to dial in exactly where this asteroid was going to hit and when. And then right on schedule, it exploded in the sky above Berlin, caused this giant fireball trail. And from that, astronomers were able to learn a lot of really interesting stuff. They could tell based on the color of the trail, what kind of a meteorite they were going to be looking for on the ground. They were able to see as the wind currents pushed the smoke trail after the meteor in the sky. And from that, they were able to tell where it would approximately land. And so they went to the right place, they looked for the right thing, and they found the asteroid. And when they did, they realized that it was something special. It's a kind of meteorite known as an albright. And so one of the things that makes it really tricky to find is that when asteroids pass through the atmosphere, they get this like black sooty material around them, which makes it very obvious you're walking through the field, you notice this weird black sooty object on the ground, you know that that might be a meteorite. But with the albrights, they get covered in this translucent glassy material, which just makes it look like a rock. And so you wouldn't notice this albright meteorite sitting there in the middle of the ground, you would think it was just another rock. And so they were able to trace this back and understand it and then use this to better understand the solar system. Now I'm going to talk some more about meteorites at the end of this episode. So stay tuned for that. Every week, we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best story. And last week, the winner was that the slim lander woke up on the moon. So thank you everybody who voted for last week's news. Now we post the news every week here on the channel. We put it out in a couple of days after we release the video, you'll see it on the community tab in our channel. But also if you're just scrolling through YouTube on your phone or on your computer, you should see the poll go ahead, vote, tell us what you think. Of course, the best chance to see this vote is to make sure you're subscribed to the channel and then click the notifications bell. Do it right now. I'll wait. A new way to measure the mass of the Milky Way. Astronomers are always looking for new ways to measure the mass of the Milky Way. And the traditional way is you just count you add up everything you add up all of the stars, all of the gas, all of the dust, you estimate how much dark matter there is. And that gives you a number. And traditionally, the mass of the Milky Way is somewhere between say 500 billion times the mass of the sun and 1 trillion times the mass of the sun. Astronomers have developed a new way to measure the mass of the Milky Way. And what they did was they looked for stars that are on escape trajectories fleeing the Milky Way. Now these stars could have been say partners of a supernova that detonated, or maybe they got too close to the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, but whatever the case, they are leaving the Milky Way and they are never coming back. And so astronomers were able to use Gaia data to track the trajectory of these stars as they're leaving. After they were able to measure the trajectory of these stars, they could then estimate the amount of matter in the Milky Way that is trying to pull them back. And so the number they got was 640 billion times the mass of the sun. And so that is in that range between the 500 and the 1 trillion, but it is sort of like closer to the lower end. And so this might mean that the Milky Way has say less dark matter than other galaxies of its size. Dust ruins another way to measure distance in the universe. Dust is an astronomer's natural enemy. So many times astronomers thought they made an incredible discovery and then it turned out to be dust. Dust! Dust! Think about what happened with Betelgeuse. Dust in between us. Think about what happened to Boyage and Star. Was it a Dyson sphere? No, it was a cloud of dust. Even measuring primordial gravitational waves in the cosmic microwave background radiation, dust. And so dust has figured out a new way to ruin observations. Astronomers are always looking for a way to measure distance in the universe. And at the closest side, we've got astrometry, and then you've got Cepheid variables, and then you've got type 1a supernova, and that gets you out to about, say, 5 billion light years away from us. And then you also have the measurements in the cosmic microwave background radiation at 13.8 billion years ago. But there's this gap in between where there aren't a lot of standard candles that astronomers can use to measure distance. But one idea was to use quasars. These are some of the brightest objects in the universe. 
A quasar is an actively feeding supermassive black hole. It is blasting out radiation into space. And astronomers thought, well, if you just measure the wavelength of the radiation that is coming from the black hole, that will tell you how much material is being gobbled up by the black hole. That will tell you just what is the intrinsic brightness of the black hole. And then you measure the brightness that you see, you know how much intrinsic brightness that it has, and that tells you the distance. And not just the black hole at the center of the galaxy, but also the radiation coming from the accretion disk around it. And so astronomers thought they had two ways to measure that distance, and then you could corroborate both of them to make sure that your number was accurate. Well, the problem is, is that you have dust in these regions as well. And that dust absorbs this radiation, warms up in infrared and then re emits it and you don't know how much dust you have dust. And so when you measure the temperature of this black hole, you don't actually know what is intrinsic luminosity is. And so this is probably not going to be a very accurate way to measure distance in the universe. If you're interested in ways to measure distance in the universe, I had an amazing interview with Dr. Adam Reese. He won a Nobel Prize for helping to discover the expansion rate of the universe. And so if you want more information about that, check out that interview. I don't know if you've noticed, but we have been on a streak for the last two weeks. We've put out a new video every single day. Now we put out all of our Q and A's, we put out all our space bites, but also we filled all the missing pieces with amazing interviews like that interview that I mentioned with Adam Reese. We've interviewed Dr. David Kipping. I've interviewed Zach and Kelly Wintersmith about why we probably won't see a city on Mars anytime soon and many more. And we do this because we can because I'm curious because there are people that I want to talk to. And I just reach out and I don't really have to care about whether or not the YouTube algorithm is going to enjoy this whether we're going to make enough money from advertising. It doesn't matter. And that's because of the support of our patrons. We are a truly independent space news agency. And that's thanks to the people who support us on Patreon. And if you notice when we do these long videos, we don't put any mid roll ads in it, we can do hour and a half interviews with no ads. We don't put any ads on our email newsletter, we don't put any ads on our podcast, we do the bare minimum amount of ads that we can. And this is a time when a lot of other media companies are going out of business. Think about Sports Illustrated and other companies that are downsizing. We don't have to. And that's thanks to the patrons, but we're not quite there. We still are somewhat reliant on ads. And I want us to get to a place where we are not reliant on ads at all. So if you want to support the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash universe today. We'd really appreciate it. Another close flyby of IO. NASA's Juno spacecraft continues its exploration of Io. It's done a bunch of flybys of this amazing volcanic moon of Jupiter. Most recently on February 3rd, it tied its closest flyby. It came within 1,500 kilometers of the surface of Io. And once again, took images of the surface and tried to spot active volcanoes on the surface of Io. And the pictures are amazing. This sounds close, but in fact, the Galileo spacecraft made way closer flybys back in the early 2000s. But it's great that we're able to see more new images close up of Io. And the big question that planetary scientists have is, is there a global magma ocean under the surface on Io? Think about Europa and Enceladus, you've got this shell of ice surrounding this liquid ocean underneath. Does the same thing exist on Io? Is there a shell of rocks surrounding an ocean of magma? It's a fascinating place and we need to learn more. Now, if you're interested in Io, and you should be, I did an amazing interview with Dr. Ashley Davis from NASA JPL. He is one of the people who is studying the images coming from Juno for these series of flybys. But also he was one of the people behind the proposal for a mission to Io. And so if you want to learn more about Io and what we can learn about this world and Jupiter and everything, check out that interview. NASA is testing the dream chaser. NASA got its hands on its first dream chaser prototype produced by Sierra Space. This is this really cool reusable cargo spacecraft. It looks kind of like the space shuttle and it's going to work very similar. It will eventually be put on top of a United Launch Alliance Vulcan rocket launched into orbit. It'll be able to deliver 3500 kilograms of cargo and supplies to the International Space Station. And then it will detach, return to Earth, pass through the atmosphere, land safely on a runway and then be filled with supplies and sent back to space again. 
So when NASA got its hands on this Dream Chaser prototype, they took it to the Neil Armstrong test facility, and they've got a couple of tests for it. The one they've already done is the vibration test where they put it on this gigantic shake table and vibrated 100 times a second. And this is to simulate launch. Can it handle the rigors of launching on the top of a rocket? Can it handle coming back through the atmosphere, all of the vibration? The next test is going to be in the vacuum chamber. This is a gigantic system that simulates the vacuum of space. It's an incredibly low pressure, and then it also can have extreme temperature changes because the spacecraft would have to handle being in full sunlight and then full shadow and go back and forth many times while it remains in orbit. If the spacecraft passes these tests from NASA, then we could expect to see it launch as early as 2024. Wait, that's this year. And there are other plans for the Dream Chaser. So right now it's only uncrewed to carry cargo, but there could be a crewed variant in the future that could have people on board, maybe a version for the military. So there's a lot of cool ideas. And I really like that NASA is going to have access to this reusable cargo vehicle for sending material to space. One last look at Ingenuity. All right, take a look at this picture of Mars. Just looks like some sand dunes. But then when you zoom in and you zoom in and you zoom in, there is the Ingenuity helicopter. Now it had an amazing run. It flew 72 times, but on that 70 second flight, it had some kind of problem. It made an emergency landing and whatever happened, it caused damage to the rotors. And so it just can't fly anymore. And so to see how it's doing, the Perseverance rover took a series of images and then a citizen scientist Simon Schmaus took those images, created a mosaic. So you've got this really nice high resolution image of both ingenuity in this desert, sandy landscape. And so that's it. That's the last we're going to see of ingenuity. Perseverance has other jobs to do. And so it has to keep moving on. And it can't keep an eye on the helicopter anymore. So what an amazing thought that there was a helicopter flying in the atmosphere of Mars. And we know that this is going to be the future of exploration. There will be a helicopter going for many future missions to Mars. Thanks, Ingenuity. Now I'm going to talk about meteorites in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Paul Rohrbach, Abe Kingston, Hey Twyla, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Ansis, Joel Yancey, and Tony Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplin, Modzo, George, David Gilton, and Andrew Gross, Jeremy Matter, Josh Schultz, Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I am a gigantic fan of meteorites. I own a whole bunch of them, but I want to show you one here. And this is a nickel iron meteorite. It's about half a kilogram. It's amazing. It really feels like a piece of space metal. And you're wondering what kind of amazing adventure I went on to go and get it. Well, I bought it or my wife bought it for me. Uh, you can buy meteorites online and there's places on eBay and others that you can actually buy them from. Now, I'm not going to recommend any specific supplier. You're going to have to do some research, but they're not that expensive. You know, for a heavier one, they're a couple of hundred dollars. You can definitely buy them for tens of dollars. And there's something really special about having a piece of space metal. And from some of those suppliers, you can also buy rocky meteorites, although those are harder to find because they are very different. They just look like a rock. So if you're looking for a gift or just for yourself, uh, consider a meteorite. They're totally worth it. All right. We'll see you next week.